Okay, uh, this is Peter O'Rourke with NAPSIG Foundation, and we're about to commence our virtual training series. This particular training session is on social media and GIS. Our first speaker today is David Alexander from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, David will be giving us his perspectives from the national and federal level on so, uh, social media and GIS. Uh, without further ado, David. All right, thank you, Peter. I'd um, just like to make a few opening remarks, kind of cover a, a couple of key points, um, both from the national perspective and, and perhaps um, some considerations at the practitioner level, both for individuals and the community. You know, I think opening us up, you know, social media offers one of the best opportunities uh, to transform our approach to shared situational awareness and to improve and expand our information sharing capabilities and outcomes. You know, it, it, it takes a village, you know, you know, for us to be more effective in information sharing and the conduct of our operations requires our ability to leverage and, more, and be more efficient in, in taking advantage of the flow of information from multiple points and sources. You know, uh, I think to do that, though, requires some, some further dialogue with the community around some, some key emerging technology trends and, and concepts or, or terms. Maybe to start, I, you know, I'd like to pose a few questions and then elaborate on, on some of those questions just briefly. You know, one is I think we need to, to start to, to talk about what do we all mean by social media and, and then what is the role of geospatial location-based technology in that domain in, in context to homeland security and public safety. And, and then, you know, some of my colleagues will probably talk about some of the opportunities and challenges or benefits that social media and GIS offer the community at large. You know, in my context, I kind of take a broad term perspective of social media refers to the interactions among people and, and devices on how we share, create, and exchange information from a more virtual community or network perspective. I think it really relies on our ability to operate across applications and platforms and interact with those multiple data sources, recognizing that a lot of the value-added data will be derived from an Internet of Things, which involves both devices, people, and sensors that is user-derived content. You know, and recognizes that often that content is going to be crowdsourced-based data or volunteered information from the citizenry or, or other relevant stakeholders. You know, that being said, you know, how do you take advantage of those sources? Uh, how do you promote that more online, more real-time collaboration and democratization? How do you ensure the trustworthiness of the information that you're receiving and apply it accordingly. How do you engage a broader and, and, and larger community base of users and stakeholders to reduce the points of coordination or the degrees of separation between the decision makers, the, the service providers, and those that are impacted or need the assistance? And, and then how do, you, how do you start to address some of the policy issues? Because technology at this time and age really outpaces policy. And how do we help to catch up on the policy side by taking advantage and advancing on the technology side through better outcomes? And some of those challenges are not just in trustworthiness, but it's in disparity of what the data may, may provide you know, is it only representing a slice of the, of the affected population or a slice of perspective? You know, is the data really portable and accessible, or is it, is it still within walled gardens of those social media platforms that are, that are pervasive out there? How usable and sensitive is the data, and, and what's the permanence around the information? Uh, I think some of those are the key concepts and, and issues. Some of the benefits, though, you know, are the immediacy and the frequency of the, the information and the, and the fact that social media advances community participation and civic action, which makes us more um, participants in, the, in pro producing more successful and better outcomes in our, in our operations. Uh, it also, though, can offer opportunities around being more anticipatory 
and focusing on, on really early warning and notifications by leveraging the trends and the speed or pace that those broader points of, of, of coordination can produce. Um, so I think to kind of wrap it up here, I think, you know, one, there's some opportunities for geospatial enablement to provide better context by knowing where things are happening and, and what the flow of information is and, and, and how that information relates to the, the areas affected. I think, two, geo, by, by being able to bridge those points of coordination and connect those right folks in large part based on vicinity, it allows us to bridge some of the, the, the gaps and the degrees of separation between those affected and servicing. Uh, and I think in turn that really promotes more on, online and more real-time collaboration. So I think those are some of the questions and, 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 and ideas that I think we would like to stimulate conversations in the community on so that we as, as, as a more national federal community can figure out where do we need to adjust our policy and doctrine and how can we improve our ability to, to adopt and, and integrate and advance uh, at a faster pace emerging technologies as well as, as incentivize uh, participation from the citizens, the public, and the, and the broad stakeholder community. Thanks, David. Um, that's, a, that's a great intro to what we're trying to accomplish here today, and we're going to hand it over to Phil Harris of Geophedia. Um, you'll see the presenter privileges being filled, handed over to Phil. Um, David gave us a great snapshot of, of what we might, how we might view social media at, at a real core level from the, the national um, and federal level, and Phil is going to now take us down to um, some application level of what Geophedia is doing um, in, in a particular example and several examples. Uh, and so, Phil, we'll turn it over to you if you're ready. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter, and uh, thanks so much for that uh, fantastic uh, introduction. Um, that uh, was a wonderful overview of, uh, I think, the opportunities and challenges around this emerging new data source and the capabilities of not only social media but uh, the uh, the geolocated social data and I think a powerful trend that's happening uh, over the last two years in particular is the 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 rapid increase of open source data public data that has uh, latitude and longitude and all coordinates appended to that social data. Uh, it's accessible in real time. It's accessible across uh, disparate platforms. And uh, it's immediate. So uh, we would uh, love to share our technology with many in the community. We're, we're doing this today with a broad set of uh, local, state, uh, federal, and even international agencies to collaborate on how we can best leverage the technology and in situations like uh, Boston or uh, Hurricane Sandy that are impacting uh, uh, you know, certain regions, uh, coordination of activities across uh, those uh, areas uh, using a common picture in part created by what's happening with the data, what's happening with the citizen population. So uh, I guess can everyone see my you should be able to see my screen here. Chime in if you, if you can't see my it, it's, screen. Yeah, we can see it. It's all good. You, you can see it. Okay, great. Um, so we are uh, Geophedia. We are uh, an aggregator of social media uh, content. Um, we define our platform by location. Uh, we are looking at social data that has a geospatial element first. And I think this is unique uh, in the marketplace. There are many social media monitoring tools available, uh, f uh, tools like Radian 6, Sysimos, Brandwatch, Hootsuite, uh, TweetDeck, and these are keyword and hashtag based tools, very useful tools, um, but they are agnostic of geography as a first cut of the data. So in the instance of Boston, we saw a Pray for Boston 
hashtag emerge, and this is where much of the conversation was happening. But this took time to develop. And in an emergency response situation, immediate data availability is, is critical uh, in helping response efforts. So we look at location first as small as a building or as large as a city, uh, whatever location is important and needs to uh, be uh, analyzed. Uh, content is real time, and we're accessing the vast majority of our content from smartphones. And uh, these smart devices, Android devices, iPhones, they have GPS embedded in their, uh, in, 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 into the device. And the social media application providers like Instagram and Twitter and others have the option to enable location as part of the social media posting process. So uh, we're seeing uh, more and more of this happening. Uh, Instagram uh, came out last summer and said that roughly 20% of their data is has the geolocation uh, coordinates on it. And we think this is a powerful trend that will continue to uh, increase uh, the amount of data availability over time. We aggregate five sources today, Twitter, YouTube, Picasso, Flickr, and Instagram, but there are literally hundreds of sources uh, available to uh, ultimately bring into the platform. We effectively enhance situational awareness by providing this real-time data from a location. You can point and click. Uh, you can uh, monitor multiple locations, a single location. Uh, we can archive data on behalf of locations that we monitor 24-7 and make that data available in the future through our data center. Um, uh, David uh, opened the conversation about sharing and collaboration. Uh, we saw in the situation in Boston where uh, an agency in Texas was monitoring uh, Boston and uh, was helping support uh, the mission in Boston through the data they were finding on Geophedia. Very helpful, very useful, and we think this coordination effort uh, at the various levels of government can be can be uh, 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 can greatly enhance response and uh, response efforts. You can filter the, the the data by keywords and hashtags once you've located by geo um, and date ranges. However, you want to parse the data, you can look for trends, patterns, and you can support a wide variety of uh, of operations. What's evolving with this new data set is the ability to provide alerts and uh, based on patterns and changes in activity by geography. So we are looking at normalized rates of activity across geographies, and then when an aberration happens, creating alerts or notifications based on that uh, that. Uh, normal level versus an acute level, and you see in situations like uh, more Oklahoma or or Hurricane Sandy or uh, Boston, you see spikes in activity from that geography when uh, events happen. In emergency response, um, we've been playing a vital role for a wide variety of agencies to allocate resources, uh, coordinate response efforts, and we're working with a number of leading groups to uh, uh, develop this application further within the EOC. We're also working uh, very closely with our partner, Esri, to make this data available inside of the ArcGIS platform, which will hopefully be available sometime in mid-summer, July, August timeframe. So for users, uh, for, for our, our guests on the line uh, that are uh, Esri fans, uh, as are we, you will have this option of accessing this data uh, through the uh, ArcGIS platform. So emergency response, perfect, perfect application. You need to filter out the vast majority of data that's not related to a geography. And this is the power of geospatial information, geospatial real-time social data that gives uh, situational awareness of what's happening, has the area been impacted or not. In the case of Hurricane Sandy that impact broad geographic regions, it was unknown the morning after, I think it was a Monday morning, exactly what was which regions were impacted most severely. But using a technology like Geophedia, 
a user, we actually did this. We went in with uh, with uh, 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 a partner of FEMA's to look to see where there were uh, issues up and down the eastern seaboard, and within a half an hour, you could you could see the Connecticut shore was not impacted. The Jersey shore was heavily impacted. Lower Manhattan was very impacted. And you could then make allocation decisions on resources and coordinate response efforts and save time and meet the needs of impacted populations much more rapidly. Uh, I mentioned resource allocation. Here are just some posts you can see from Hurricane Sandy on what uh, the types of content that's available. And, and I'll show you uh, some views of our tool at the end, and we can perform a real-time search, uh, provided uh, WebEx, uh, the WebEx uh, uh, webinar cooperates with us. But this is just a great source of real-time intel. And the beauty of a location-based search tool is that images and videos are often not tagged with words. When someone's sharing with their friends a picture of a taxi cab half submerged in water, they're not taking the time to write, look at this taxi cab that's submerged in water, or look at this great hurricane picture that I took. They're just sharing the picture. And this is a great source of intelligence. So by looking at the geolocation parameters, you can see very quickly a tapestry view of what's happening not only at a specific point in time, but how it evolves over time. So what we see is normal patterns before an event, like uh, the shooting that happened in Colorado. Uh, you know, moviegoers were anticipating the debut of the, the, the movie and were going and, and, and announcing to their friends how they were excited to see the, the opening night. Then you see posts of, oh, I heard gunshots, and then panic and chaos. And then, of course, there's the post-event uh, monitoring and post-event uh, social media. So it's a very, very interesting timeline of, of, of activity that, tip, that emerges, and that's available to you. And uh, we as a service will archive and host the data um, and allow you to access that, that data over a, a, a defined period of time. Uh, a tool like Geofedia has been used for digital investigation. Uh, we have many jurisdictions using it to investigate homicides. Many times homicides happen in jurisdictions and there's no eyewitnesses. People run away. But people often comment on social media when they hear gunshots or they witness something. Um, they still might run away, but they might report on it and indicate uh, – uh, what happened or what they heard and what they saw. This provides almost an immediate uh, source of leads and intelligence to perform uh, some follow-up digital investigation. Sometimes homicide investigations start with no leads. Well, isn't, wouldn't it be great to have a few leads if people who heard gunshots had auditory evidence and that information is time-stamped? It's not only the where, it's the when and then with the social media handle, it's the who. So this opens up a broad range of sources to further investigate and follow up on intelligence-related work, uh, not only for homicide, but for a wide range of, of, of activities uh, from uh, human trafficking to uh, homicide to uh, arson to any sort of criminal event, who was there at that point in time, did anyone hear anything, did anyone see anything, and can I use that person as a resource to gather more uh, situational awareness and intelligence on, 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 uh, to help that effort. Venue security, uh, tools like Geofedia are great to use at uh, events when there's large populations of people. Uh, we will be used quite heavily over July 4th to monitor groups of people at different, you know, various locations in cities like Boston and other places around the United States, we are relying on the data. And where there are people, there's data. And where there are events and people, there's lots of data. So any venue, a sporting event, um, a protest, uh, a rally, um, any sort of event where there's high populations of people, 
we are seeing more activity and more data availability. And uh, we expect this trend to continue. We expect uh, private industry to, to promote geolocation. And we're working with many brands to work on uh, campaigns to promote the posting. You know, we, we think of geolocation as uh, an, an ability to add uh, kind of social media on steroids. Okay, so social media, the purpose of social media is to share. People are doing it because they want to share. They're making this information publicly available because they want to share. And perhaps this is a generational phenomenon of maybe sub-30 type individuals. Um, maybe it'll be adopted more broadly across the spectrum, but people want to become more public as opposed to less public. If you want to make your social media voice in the digital landscape more pronounced, should you turn on geolocation? I was at the concert, okay? So how do you let your friends know you were at the concert? You enable your geolocation. I was at this place. I was there. I was there. So we're seeing this growing phenomenon of people activating geolocation for specific intentions of sharing more, pro uh, more, um, uh, more, uh, more broadly. Now, I'm not suggesting that criminals are photographing their faces and turning on geolocation and saying, I... You know, here I am, come get me. Okay, we're not necessarily seeing that phenomenon. What we are seeing, though, is in situations like Boston, many people taking pictures of the situation, okay? And the perpetrators were in that environment, right? Perhaps they were captured on social media by just a normal person, an average person, taking a picture of their loved one crossing the finish line. And so it's becoming, I think, harder for crowded populations and other places for terrorists and other bad actors to, to hide from uh, the citizen journalist who's on the street documenting their life, sharing their life. And this is a resource for you. This is all public information. This is a resource to do good things, support good missions. And so we as a firm have taken the position of only granting access to Geofedia to responsible organizations who, will, uh, who are doing good work and supporting uh, a, a positive mission of protecting the law and serving, uh, serving the public and reinforcing brand uh, brands in a positive way. Uh, I mentioned counterterrorism. Um, we are language agnostic. Uh, we can handle uh, any kind of language because we're, again, looking at geolocation. So this is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, you know, many Terrorist activities are planned in different countries, and then they're acted out on in, in places like the United States and other, other countries. It doesn't matter. You can go globally with this. Now, the penetration of start smartphones and geolocation is lagging in abroad uh, compared to the United States, but we believe that as feature phones phase out, if feature phones are phones that don't have these smartphone capabilities, and smartphones become adopted by the world at large, this makes even a more powerful use case of the technology. So this is not just an affluent country phenomenon, a Western Europe and the United States phenomenon. We believe that this is a worldwide phenomenon that will continue to, uh, continue to advance. Um, I bring up community engagement because you can reach out to people on social media very easily once you've identified them. Um, people actually call for help through social media the Red Cross performed a study several years ago uh, saying that uh, uh, it was some large percentage of individuals who send out an SOS on Twitter expect a response, okay? You know, people expect to be engaged on social media. This is not like you're, you're, you're looking at the data and you're, 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 taking, you're, you're, you're taking something from someone. No, they want to share. And in fact, many people expect you to listen as responders. So this concept of filtering out things that aren't related to an impacted geography, filtering out the noise, get to the signal quickly, get the response efforts to the people who need it, help identify witnesses at the location where it happened. This filtering is the key, and I think the traditional approach has been big data, get more data. How can we get more data? How can we aggregate more data, more data? No, no, how can we get the right information to the right individuals to make the right judgment call to respond to an effort is really what our position as a company 
um, and how do we deliver that? And, and again, I'll mention our, our partnership with Esri. Esri has a large install base with many of you, worldwide install base. We want to make that data, our data, available through that platform and get it into your hands to support your, uh, support your good work. This uh, data can apply to the private sector. Uh, we have many large uh, companies who have their own security efforts, protecting their executives, protecting, protecting their sensitive property, plant, and equipment, uh, monitoring events. Uh, the same kind of workflow exists here, and we hope that there's a private-public partnership here where uh, intelligence and information is shared uh, among uh, private enterprise and public enterprise, and how can we how can we collaborate to uh, achieve uh, a good outcome and create good intelligence and create those alerts, as uh, Mr. Alexander mentioned at the beginning of the call, turn this from a monitoring solution to more of a proactive solution, creating those alerts and notifications and those triggers based on uh, criteria that are uh, relevant to a situation so that we can avert a, a situation before it happens. And, and this is happening today through monitoring, through uh, 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 Geophedia and through other social media uh, methods. In, in Tempe, Arizona, uh, there was a uh, Twitter user announcing that uh, he was going to enter into a school and kill one of his teachers and some friends, or not friends, some, 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 some other students. Uh, and uh, was announcing it on, on, on Twitter. We picked it up on Geophedia. The Tempe police uh, detained the, the youth and found the weapons and everything, and this became a big news story, and this is why I mention it uh, to you broadly. Uh, many times our use cases aren't mentioned broadly, but this was actually made the, the television. And that kind of capability, imagine if that officer in Tempe had been alerted automatically to say, okay, someone's talking about killing and, and school. And, 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 and that person was notified, think of how many things we could avoid and prevent before they actually happen. And in that situation, Tempe police was not using the platform. It was another police force using the platform, saw the post, notified the Tempe police. So this collaboration across uh, different groups you know, to coordinate response had be helpful across geographies we think is a, a nice way to leverage the uh, leverage the data. So, uh, if Peter, if we have a couple of minutes, I can jump into the tool to actually show a search. If you yeah, you have you have five minutes, and as you're pulling it up, and this is for Ryan and, and David as well. I mean, the 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 question that I keep getting sent to me, um, and and it's obviously the perennial social media question is, it's great what happened in Tempe. Um, but when you have something that's a little bit more of a broadly um, or common, say, a uh, use phrase like hurricanes, um, how do you filter out the junk? How do you separate the junk? And a great example I got was we, we were monitoring Sandy, uh, Hurricane Sandy, and we got a lot of uh, social media Twitter feeds from hurricane parties, um, which isn't what they were looking for. So. Um, how do you, you know, how do you get into that sort of issue in, in terms of actually separating the junk from the useful data, and 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 what is junk versus useful data? <laughs> some of it's not technical, some of it's just practice. I get that. Uh, well, it, it, it's a great question. Um, when you search geospatially, you get the contextual, uh, you get the texture of what's happening at a location, and so when you do that, um, you you do filter out. A significant majority of the noise because things happen at a place. Hurricanes happen at a place. Uh, storms hit at a place. Uh, bombs blow up at a place. And so this this geospatial, this GIS component, and I think as geospatial professionals, it's a very important point. You'll, you're able to cut out the vast majority of the noise. Now there's still going to be noise. Okay, so when you go into a geography. Um, uh, even, frankly, the finish line of the Boston Marathon, there you would see some posts of people who weren't commenting on the bomb. Okay, the vast majority of people were, so you will get the noise. Um, I think what you, what our strategy is to allow the further filtering. So location first, because events, um, situations happen at a place, you'll eliminate the noise. 
and uh, a lot of the noise, and then further filtering by uh, a keyword or maybe you just want to see videos or just tweets, further filtering of the data set beyond geospatial is yet another way. Um, I don't think there's any perfect solution until we have uh, image, uh, facial image recognition technology embedded into social media or some other, some other image, um, image recognition technologies. I think it will require some level of human judgment to uh, look at that refined data set and make a call because remember the veracity, this is social media. There are people who are posting erroneous messages to deceive you to become famous or get notoriety. So our, our words of, of advice are, uh, well, let's take a use case. In, in Manhattan, someone tweeted that the New York Stock Exchange had flooded. And then there was a picture associated with it as well. And we received calls saying, what do you think? And we said, we don't think this actually happened because the stock exchange had flooded. We would see not just one post, we would see many posts. And then when you went into, when you see a situation like Boston or the Empire State Building shooting, you will see dozens of posts emerge within minutes of that kind of event. And so volume across disparate users, disparate sources is a good proxy to uh, assess the veracity of, of the data. Peter, did you have another question or should I execute a sh search here to show people what, what, uh, how this works in action at a basic level? Uh, Phil, do that. I think I think your response was helpful, and and again, it really you know data me is meaningless to some response agencies, and, and the same piece of data is exceptionally meaningful to another agency. So part of it is the filtering, filtering, and getting used to just managing the data. So um, you've got about five minutes to to um, give us a, a quick tour, and then we'll pass it over to Ryan. Thanks, Phil. Great. Okay, so here I have a. Uh, a map, you should be seeing a map of Bryant Park. Bryant Park is a park just down the street from Grand Central Terminal in Manhattan. And uh, I will perform a hyper-local search of this area just so we can go in and see, you know, what's been and good is happening at uh, Bryant Park today. And you can, uh, because we have GIS professionals on the phone, this should be fairly intuitive to you. But we, here I'm creating a, what we call a geo feed, a geo feed which is effectively a geofence um, of uh, a virtual perimeter around Bryant Park to see what's happening. So if you could simulate with me what, what, what uh, happened in Boston, okay, there was a rumor that something had happened. Um, you think of doing a broad search across all of Boston. You see some pictures or that, uh, that something happened. Maybe here was here in Bryant, role play here with me, and this is Bryant Park. Um, you go in to do more of a refined search, and these pins represent um, items uh, that have been pulled out from um, Bryant Park. And you'll see Instagram pictures, you'll see tweets, and uh, you can then go into what we call our collage mode. This is our map mode, our collage mode, which then shows the pictures of you know what's happening at Bryant Park today. It looks like a pretty nice day in uh, in, in Midtown Manhattan. Um, and you can just keep going down and down the screen in reverse chronological order and see, you know, you, I'm sure you'll see here just pictures of um, people just enjoying their days in, in Bryant Park. There's no real event, but this is a way to monitor in this picture the backside of the New York Public Library. Um, imagine if this was monitored in the background. What I'm performing right now is a real-time search. Um, we have the capability to monitor in the background, archive, and save all the data, and and then host it on your behalf for locations that matter to you. And many of our clients monitor government facilities or neighborhoods that are sensitive to crime or related to a certain case or related to a certain event. Um, and you can just keep going down and down, and we'll load more items into um, into what we call our our, our our collage view, and it just keeps going and going. There's just a lot of data and a lot of content available. Now, there's nothing happening at Bryant Park, so it's it, you know people are just having fun. And here's the uh, the carousel in the park. I guess it's set up for the summertime. And and when you go back to the map view, all of those pins that we located are here on the uh, on the map. So we are an aggregator. 
we want to provide a one source location, one stop location to get many sources. Today we have five sources. Um, there are dozens we can add. It's a rich data set. These devices, people, and sensors are growing exponentially. Uh, we hope that you can adopt this technology and use it and test it. We have free trials available. Um, we're collaborating with partners like Esri. We're collaborating in events like with Boston to help do good work. And so uh, if you have an interest in our, our uh, testing out our platform, we're offering trials at geofedia.com, and we just look forward to assisting, uh, assisting and being helpful where we can. So, Peter, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to ask, or if you want to turn it to Ryan, we can do so now. Okay, great. Yeah, let's uh, turn it over to Ryan. Uh, right now, Ryan, you should be seeing um, privileges being passed to you. Um, Phil will stay on the line if anyone has additional questions, uh, but now we'll hear from Ryan Glenn Close, uh, who uh, used to be at the State of Missouri, is now with the Esri Public Safety Team. Uh, Ryan, it's all you. Uh, thanks, Peter, and, and thanks, Phil and David, for, for a great introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to kind of pick up where Phil left off, and you know, my perspective today is coming not just from Esri, but it's really from our disaster response program and some of the work that we've supported recently with Hurricane Sandy and even recently as last week with the Moore tornado, how social media continues to escalate in people's minds and become much more prominent in the way that we think about integrating social media with our GIS data uh, maps and applications. So I'd like to show you a couple examples of what you can do today, some actions you can take after this call to, to start at least layering social conversation on top of your maps and apps to, to add that context to it, um, just as Phil showed. And, We'll show a little bit from Geophedia as well as of recent examples around the Boston Marathon. So I mentioned that I'm coming from the perspective of our disaster response program. And you know, traditionally when people think of Esri and, and they call us for help when something bad happens, it's it's to help with surge software for volunteers or staff that are that are on site or it's to replace systems that have been lost during a disaster. But we also help people with um, using data and making data operational, so not just uh, making maps for people, but helping them get it into the operator's hands to hopefully make better decisions and action. And we do that remotely a lot of times in the cloud and, and through web maps, but we'll also deploy people on site in the case of Hurricane Sandy and in Boston and in more tornado, we actually had people on site locally working with the offices there with, with you on the phone to help use this technology to, to implement best practices and workflow supporting disaster management. And if we look back kind of historically when disaster strikes or something bad happens, we've traditionally gotten three requests if we put them in big buckets. And it was really about data support. So it was, for example, how do we get imagery and operationalize that um, so that we can get better situational awareness. And that led to number two, which was they wanted to be able to visualize good data. And that was web maps to interact and start to get operational context of, of individual resources and logistics. And we did web mapping quite a bit. And then we supported traditional workflows for emergency management, things like how do we do a damage assessment with GIS? So taking paper-based processes that are well-defined and implementing GIS technology to support that. And while those haven't really gone away, so to speak, we still get quite a bit of requests for those, we're seeing a new trend start to emerge. And it, it really picked up at Hurricane Sandy, and it's just continued to, to grow over time. And you'll see the third one being social media and really crowdsourcing, right? participant mapping and engaging the citizens of the community to help us collect good, relevant information. Um, so the other ones are around collaboration and sharing content and information and increasing that. And I think David mentioned the idea of shared situational awareness among organizations, which just continues to be paramount for us to do good response. Um, but it's also the idea that when we start to do that, we get easily overwhelmed with information. And I think that's very similar to social media. Right? The question that I think Peter raised earlier was how do we start to filter out the noise and really focus in on relevant content for not only the jurisdiction, but for the context of the event. And so we really think a lot about how we deliver more focused maps and applications, right? not broad-based applications with a lot of data, excuse me, a lot of data and tools, but really focused on the need at hand. What's the question that we're trying to answer when somebody asks, I need a map? And that's the same for social media. So how can we begin to provide context to the social stream using the element of location, right, geography, 
and the keyword search that just like Phil demonstrated very well with the Geophedia of how can we start to filter on hashtags and really drive into context awareness around what people are talking. And then finally, one of our last trends, which is, which is interesting, is that we're, how do we communicate the work that we're doing as organizations, and social media plays a part of that. How do we communicate back to those individuals who are contributing content to us through social media and crowdsourcing to let them know what we're doing as an agency in response mode? Um, so I'd like to focus today really on social media. I know this is a, a series of workshops with NAPSIG and a series of training. And the next one will be more focused on crowdsourcing and engaging the crowd to help us collect data. So my, my talk today will be pretty much on social media and some steps to take immediately there. So I'd like to, to take a look and start here um, on the web. And this is going to be at Esri.com on disaster. This is where we catalog you know, hazard-specific maps that are, in our case, kind of steady state. These are live dynamic things that are always up and running. And they contain social media. So one of the things that we often asked to do is to overlay that social media so that people get context of not just where an event is occurring, like the tornado or the current flooding in the Midwest, but what's the community saying about that? What are videos and what are photos that are being captured around that uh, event itself? And so here's an example of, of a recent event. So this was Hurricane Sandy, and you'll notice some data from, from New York. And this is the evacuation zones and evacuation centers and the red dots. And the green clusters and the little blue icons are actually social conversation looking in the geography of New York, filtered by hashtag for hurricane or storm or wind. Right? So we have the ability to start to really refine what we're looking at and start to collect that. So a practical example of, of how we do that. And the way we do that is through this template that's freely available that people can use today, and it's in available in ArcGIS Online called the Social Media Template. And so I'd like to take a second and walk you through that process of how we, how we make those maps. So starting here on the home base, we're live on the web. You'll notice there are a couple of menu items here from our disaster response that are hazard specific, whether it's for flooding or severe weather, or even earthquakes that may uh, be occurring. So if we take a look at one of these pages, you'll see flooding. And what we've done is embed that public information map, that social media context aware map, directly in the web page. So here we're looking live at, at data coming from a number of providers. In this case, we're looking at flood warnings that are coming in from the National Weather Service, observed flooding, the stream gauge sensors that are indicating flood level coming in from the National Weather Service, all live and dynamic. Right? So we can interact with the map, pretty traditional stuff for GIS users. right? We just configured pop-ups and made our map relevant to this hazard. But the green clusters are actually where the social conversation is occurring. So in the top of these pages, you'll notice there's a, a social tab. So right now we're looking at Flickr, Twitter, and YouTube. So I'm going to actually sign in real quick to, to Twitter here so we can actually see that. Let the map reload. <clears throat> All right, so now on the social tab, you'll notice we're searching Flickr against the Twitter API and then YouTube as well. So the clusters are where we're seeing that conversation occur. So we click on one of the clusters um, here in the middle. Got a lot of information coming up here. <laughs> so now we start to see that. So floods were heading, what people are saying about the, the flood, and pictures, photos, and the like. Right? So what we've done is we've taken GIS data, we've packaged it up into this map, and we publish that into the application that we're going to walk through and how we do this exact process here um, using your data back home. So let me switch gears and, and look behind the scenes. How did we get to that web map that's currently available on the site? So here's where we start. Right? This is our disaster response program, ArcGIS Online account. This is how we start to collaborate and pull information together to package up into what we call the web map. And that's what we use to share into that application. So I'm going to sign in. And by the way, that home page on the front is publicly available, so anybody can access and, and look at these maps and apps at any time. I'm just going to start making a map. So I'm going to go blankly uh, to the map page here. And let's do more Oklahoma, right? That's a very recent event that we've been working on. So I'm going to search for the location of more Oklahoma, navigate to that area. Now, traditionally when we start looking for data and we want to add data, sometimes we're going to find readily available content, and other times it's taking your content and getting it available into the map itself. Right, so let's look at a couple different examples. So within our organization, one of the, the data sets that we worked on was imagery. Right? So I've actually got 
a bunch of image sets here, so you'll notice there's a, a lot of data that's coming in here from, from imagery on the side. Um, we can refine that further if I want to look for Oklahoma specific. Oklahoma imagery. And there we go. So I see a couple of interesting stuff. I can look at the details about this. In this case, this was an imagery that was acquired and donated by Bering Tree Land Survey um, out of Oklahoma. So here's the, the imagery data set post-event, and here's one of the, the hospital locations here around Moore, Oklahoma, for example. So pretty common, right? That's, that's a nice example to have whenever you've got data readily available and it's already been registered and you can discover that content and add it. But many times what a lot of you work with are service directories like this. So these are a lot of the data services that we use to support disaster response. And one of those is a preliminary damage uh, track that came in from the National Weather Service. So if we were to click on one of these, you're going to get the REST endpoint, right? The URL that a lot of you are familiar with in GIS terms. And that's the pointer to the data that's living on your servers back home. So if I come into the map, I can actually look at adding that data directly to it. So let me make sure this reloaded here. There we go. So I'm actually just going to take this URL. Right? So here's the endpoint to that service. We know it's a feature service with tornado damage. You can go back to our map and add that. So we're not going to search for data. In this case, I'm going to add my content that we have just like you would back home. So I'm going to add this layer from the web. And you'll notice here I've got a bunch of different options. So it's not just about Esri services, but it's OGC compliance, it's KML files, right? it's GRSS and, and CSV files and the like. So I'm going to add that web service directly in here, add that layer to the map. So now we've got in context of the map starting to mash up the imagery, the post-event uh, survey that's been done by NOAA. And I'll just add one additional layer here uh, for context, which is interesting. I'll look for damage pics. So these were photos that were kind of crowdsourced from news media uh, to show context. So we can look at that on the map itself. Okay. So once I've completed that, you've taken your data from your URLs, your web services, your, your shape files, right, your spreadsheets, and your data sets directly on the map. It's easy enough as just saving the map. So I'm going to save this as more tornado map. Excuse my typing. And we'll comment with a couple of tags here so I can easily find this later. So um, what I'm essentially creating is a, a little package right, of, of data itself. And I'm going to save that so I can use this again. So one of the things I mentioned as a, as a trend is two things. One is adding social context to this map, but the second part is in telling the story effectively. So I want to make sure that I put some metadata to find this and be able to communicate with others what this map provides. And then I want to tell my story. So I'm going to share this map. In this case, I'll share it with everyone publicly. And I could either send them a map link directly to this, but I'm not really interested in, in that context. I'm thinking about how do we get to that website, right? How do we get to the Ezra.com map that we started with that showed social in the conversation? So there's two ways. So one is just I want to embed this map as it is using this little HTML code. That's pretty basic. It, it's not going to add a lot of functionality. It's simply going to take my data that we just added and make it a nice embeddable map on the website. But if you look on the right, we've got make a web application. These are prepackaged templates that are available for use right now. And on the second page of this template selection, we've actually got a social media template. Right? So this is how we start to embed that social conversation on the map. So if I take a look at this and actually say I want to publish this map, what it does, it's going to take my map again, this map with social media. So I'm going to give it a name. The tags, I'm going to leave everything else the same, and I'll publish this. So when I hit publish, essentially what it did is wrap my map up into this application with no coding, and now it made me a social media application. And we can configure that application because it's just like Phil did an excellent job of describing, it's not about just showing me everything going on in the social conversation, it's about filtering it down to relevant content. So on the left, on the, excuse me, on the right hand side, you'll notice that I've got a list of things I can just easily configure. So I can determine if I want people to search on the map or share the map. And if I go back down, I can determine how I want them to, to see this. Do I want to see just the actual points of conversation or the clusters like we looked at at the beginning? So I can choose some of that detail. And then at the bottom, we can start to add very context specific. So in this case, we're already searching a keyword on Twitter for weather. But I could do other things. So look for a tornado. Right, so I'll just kind of copy this string here. We'll do the same thing for Flickr, which would be great. And we can set the date range. So we'll look in this last month. 
We we'll also look for YouTube videos of the same. So I'm going to save that. So basically, I've just configured this application using a couple of checkboxes, saved my map, and now we're starting to see that context again. So if I sign back into to Twitter, right, it's pretty common. And I'm going to say I'm going to authorize that, reload. So now I'm going to get very context-specific data around more Oklahoma, looking very uh, specifically around tornado and weather in the keyword search in this geography. So this map then is embedded, and that's where we come back to this starting point where we began the conversation. And I've taken my data, I've gone in and I've packaged it up into the web map, and I've published an application that has social media built into it. And here it is live on the website just as we constructed the Moore Oklahoma Tornado Public Information Map. And this could very easily be your geography, your context and information with social directly on top of it today. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I wanted to walk you through that process of how you can start um, so I'd like to show one more example from a recent event. And Ryan, uh, um, before yeah. you do that, just uh, one question, technical point. Um, where did you find the rest endpoints on the Esri site again? Could you show that to the group? We had a couple yeah. of folks ask about that. Absolutely. So for those of you that have servers, right, that are running ArcGIS server and publishing your data and content, you're going to actually get a URL. So it, within your local infrastructure, you're going to have a directory. So it may be, you know, cityofboston.com, for example, slash, ArcGIS REST services. Okay. That takes you to this home page directory. And within that, that's the data that you're publishing from desktop and sharing as a live dynamic map service. So that's where I picked them. So if you were to go into any one of these uh, service folders, you're actually going to get this whole URL. Okay. So this is what we're looking at is this REST service of this name, and it's a feature service, meaning I actually get the feature stream that I can do interaction with on the map. So you will go to your local server, your local URL for your domain, type in ArcGIS slash REST slash services. And once I've got that URL, that's what we plugged in directly to the map itself. So we added that as a, as a web layer. So add file from web, connect to that point. That help, Peter? That helps me. I'm pretty sure it helps them, too. <laughs> Thanks. Sure thing. All right, so you know, Phil did a really good job of, of showing uh, the work that we're kind of conveying together and we're working between Geofia and Esri. And he mentioned Boston as one of the examples. And I wanted to highlight Phil and their team because of their response during the Boston Marathon explosions. Right, the, they were able to pull data directly from an area around the, the Boston bombing site to deliver that to us. And, a CSV file that we could start integrating directly into ArcGIS and support the response directly from requests that we had um, on scene. So what we're looking at here, and, and please disregard anything on the right-hand side that's, um, that's not good, because as somebody asked the question, social media is wide open, right? People can say whatever they want to on social media. So a hurricane uh, search along the Gulf Coast is going to find a hurricane party on, on Bourbon Street in New Orleans, just like it's going to find true to the stuff about the hurricane and depending on the shoreline. So keep that in mind. So what we're looking at here that, that Phil's team was able to pull was a context-specific search around a geography in a certain date range. So we're looking at data here from uh, April 17th back to approximately April 14th. Right? So you see there's 66,000 or 6,600 records or so within an area. And this was interesting because the request was not just to show everything in Boston, but they wanted a one-kilometer area around the, the finish line on that date to start doing some analysis with. So what were the trends in conversation? Did somebody happen to capture something? So I wanted to show you how we could use that today, right? So if you're working with Phil and Geophedia, one of the things we can do directly in Excel with this Esri Maps is I'm just going to map this to show you what the data looks like. So I'm going to add a map just like I would add a, a chart or a, wood, um, a table within this. I'm telling them I'm going to add Excel data. So Phil very eloquently laid out right, the data here is location specific. So we've already got a latitude and longitude in this. If I had a, a street name, we could geocode against that. I could change and select the right thing for latitude and longitude, X and Y, and then add that to the map. So the, the map itself is now adding the spreadsheet into this embedded map. And there's our, our records directly on top of Boston uh, within a one kilometer radius of the, the finish line talking about social media and conversation. And so we could then begin to interact with one of these, take a look at things. So we're looking at Instagram photos and Twitter, Flickr, and YouTube. So while it's great that we certainly have data, 
again, it's about symbolizing that effectively and then sharing that to tell the story so that other people can pick it up in the organization and use it. So one of the things we can do is start looking at grouping, for example. Um, so Phil, and the great thing about Geofeed is that they actually aggregate a lot of different locations into one. So I'm going to say I want to look at grouping my data by the source um, and Phil describe the sources that they pick. So I could come in here and you know, pick, so maybe for you know, Flickr, we want to come in and pick a couple of different colors. Instagram, we'll just symbolize this a little differently. And then we'll finish up with Twitter at the last. We'll hit OK. So this will take a little bit of time here to, to symbolize those things. So what we just did was change the context. And so I'm just looking at points, but I'm actually going to get some context on what type of data we're actually looking at. Down with that, so I can turn off the clustering and zoom back in. So as this finishes up and starts to draw, the next step that logically comes from this is not just to view the social media in Excel, but to start interrogating, to ask the questions spatially and temporally around the data. What were the trends? Where were the hot spots in the data? Um, can we look for certain keywords or sentiment that were related in there? So we can start to do that within Excel, but also then, more importantly, share this layer up. So you notice on the ribbon toolbar, I've got the opportunity to share this layer and so we've actually done that on the other side. Let me flip to our web map. And here we are looking at a live map of the Boston area, taking into account that feed directly from that. And I've filtered this, so you can come in and take a look at my filters um, directly from that, looking only for things with imagery. Right? So I want to see only things with pictures, so Instagram, Flickr, uh, Picasso that were within that. And then we can come in and click on any one of these points and then go out and explore what the photo was that was taken directly from that location. So now it's a layer within our GIS, within the platform that we can interrogate, mash up, and use within our maps themselves. So I just wanted to kind of come back to where Phil started the conversation. So it's about filtering on geography. It's about filtering on context-specific stuff. And this is a good example of using just geography and catching everything within a geography and allow you then to do in your intelligence work on top of that data. So with that, I'm going to pause at the end here for any questions. And maybe just to summarize a couple of things uh, that we looked at today. You know, my, my idea for this was that we want to give you actionable steps that you can take today. Right? Start adding social conversation into your maps using your data locally. Um, you got a hint of the future that we're working on with Geofedia because it is about analytics. So when are conversations trending? And where are they trending? And when should I start to pay attention to them? It's really interesting. And we'll show more about that as we continue the, the training series as well. So the next webinar will focus on some crowdsourcing aspects and engaging the, the public to help us collect data and not just use social media to, to widely you know, collect information, but let them focus on a task at hand like show me damage or, or power outages, for example. Um, and then we'll finally end up with some advanced analytics in the third series where we're using GIS and spatial analytics to really gain an understanding of trends in the social conversation um, that we started today. So with that, thank you, Peter. I'm happy to, to finish with questions with Phil and David as well. But I appreciate it. Sure, I, I have um, uh, a few questions. But uh, as we're getting close on time, I'll try to get one a uh, couple that are just pressing. Uh, one comment is uh, the, what you were just demonstrating, Ryan, um, is something that um, they would like to see. I don't know if we have time to do it now, but demonstrated in, in their apps, not so much on ArcGIS Online. Is this something that they can do? Uh, public safety can do a outside of the ArcGIS Online environment in the apps world? Yeah, so depending on the app, so there are, if folks are using like Flex Viewer applications for one, one example, there is a social media widget for that available for download that you can start to add social media onto that map as well. Right, so there are other options. We just wanted to show you an example of connecting that directly into ArcGIS Online. That's the way we've taken the work that we rolled as a, as a company in the disaster response team into an application that's you know easy to configure and be off and running. So there are other examples, and we're happy if they have specifics on that. Maybe through you, Peter, directly. Happy to help answer those more specifically. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know a few of the comments I'm getting, which are not news to anybody, really, is in, in seeing some of the examples that we've been, um, you know, you got you and and Phil were able to post. You really do see how much is uh, you know junk or, or non-actionable yeah. data is in there. So um, the, the community, as you're well aware, is really focused on trying to find ways to get actionable data. 
And again, that's not necessarily always a technology solution as much as it is, uh, you know, a, a, a perspective solution because that useless useless data might have some meaning to somebody else. So. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, you guys certainly have seemed to take a, a wonderful step in the right direction uh, with guidance from David and DHS. I think it's a the you know this discussion that we're trying to start now. Uh, we can start refining a bit more and, and finding out what specifically the public safety community in the state and county and local levels need. Um, with that being said, um, and, and given there you know we are running out of time, we try to keep these things as prompt as possible. Um, if you have specific questions for Ryan or David or Phil, please contact me directly, or you can see Ryan's email uh, information there. No matter what, we'll get we'll get answers to you. Um, more important, perhaps, as Ryan indicated, uh, NAPSIG is looking to do more of these social media uh, virtual training sessions. So, if there are things that we touched on now, which really today was meant to be a bit of a teaser. Uh, there are things we touched on now that you would like us to expand upon. Please let me know, again, by my email, uh, and I can um, add those to the next series of um, uh, training sessions with, with great ease. And really what we're trying to do is see, to the extent possible, what we can do to share um, and provide good examples of what's happening now and what will be happening in the future. Um, so please do feel free to contact me at any point if you have any ideas. Um, one logistical item, uh, you should be able to see my desktop now. This is the NAPSIG Foundation website. Um, all of our virtual training series are posted under the latest news sec section, so the one that David Alexander did um, recently on the GEO platform and GII uh, is available, as you can see right here. It's available for download, very easy to get access to, and you can see the entire session. Um, David, Phil, Ryan, anything more from you all that you would like to uh, share with the audience or, or um, any questions or comments? Uh, Peter, I'd just echo I'd like to thank you guys for the opportunity to participate and provide a few few talking points and uh, just look forward to the continued conversation and engagement. Yeah, likewise, Peter. I think it's it's been an, an interesting conversation. I think the the questions that have come in really highlight where we need to go with technology and hopefully help you know strengthen the, the data that we see. You know, my my take at this point, we're trying to show how we can add this as another layer for situational awareness, right? It's not the only layer that we pay attention to. And I think David did a good job in his intro of, you know, it's one layer of context. Um, your other data coming in from your business systems and like help validate what you're seeing in the social conversation. And as I hope as we continue the, the training series, we'll get into a little bit more of the analytics and how you can really start to interrogate the data to hopefully filter away even more of the noise that we typically experience with the public. So, so thanks for the opportunity. It's been fun. Well, we're really appreciative of, of all that you three do, and we're extremely grateful for everyone who uh, participated and signed on to this session. Um, we're grateful for all that you do for us as citizens. Please feel free to contact me if we can do anything to support you in any way, um, in particular in the context of this particular session. If there are things you'd like to see in the next training session, uh, we can dig into something very granular or we can go a bit deeper and, and wider. Uh, we're happy to do that. So feel free to call me at any time. Um, and thank you again. This will conclude the session. Um, and please look out for the next training session that will be coming up, which is on symb map symbology on June 6th. Uh, thank you again to everybody, and thank you to our panelists.